as we age, we, uh, there's a phenomenon called inflam inflammatory. So it's a contraction of inflammation and aging. And there is several things happening as we age. There's uh, the, the, what we call, um, what is called the seven pillars of aging, uh, which basically has very seven things that overlap between normal aging and neurodeg neurodegenerative diseases. And out of these seven, the central one is inflammation. So as we age, we have more inflammation going on, and we know that there is uh, more um, uh, cell adhesion molecules to site one. So there is cell adhesion molecules that start to be expressed at the endothelium, which is normally not there, or a very minimal uh, quantity. And we start having significant amount of these cell adhesion molecules throughout the whole body. And the brain is very uh, sensitive to that, to that because these cell adhesion molecules, what they do is they collect the immune cells from the brain, uh, from the blood, sorry, to bring them into the brain. The more you have, the more inflammation, the, what we call neuroinflammation, the more inflammation you have in your brain. So that's a normal aging process. And the fact that those cell, endothelial cells turn into a pro-inflammatory phenotype the pericytes that are right next to them will, will so there is a crosstalk, there is, I won't go into details, but the pericyte will have to detach because to let the, the immune cells go through. Physically, if the pericyte stays attached to the, vas to the vessel, there is no possibility, possibility for the, the immune cells to go through and do their job. So the fact that there is more inflammation of the vasculature as we age, there is more detachment, like uh, I would say physiological detachment of brain parasites. That's one thing. And we, there's some report that uh, as we age, there is less, we, are, we don't have the capability, I mean, the parasites don't have the capability to reattach as we can do as we are young. So I don't know if that's clear, but at least there is some hint some, uh, that tells us that um, the fact that the, the, the endothelial cells become more inflamed in a way, the vasculature is inflamed, the pericyte will react to that in a, in a bad way. Um, and so they will start shortening their processes also, so I didn't mention it, but pericytes, it's a, it's a small cell body with a, a process, like small processes like a, an octopus kind of thing, uh, sitting on top of a vessel. And all these processes are here to, to, to push the blood flow basically and maintain the integrity. And these processes will shorten uh, because of the inflammation. And of course, if the, the pericytes are shortening their processes, the flow will reduce. And if it's a chronic thing, if, if we think about chronically having too much inflammation at the, at the vasculature, the pericytes will chronically detach more and more and shortening their processes. So the leakage of the barrier will, be, will, will come uh, at some point because... Uh, uh, the tight junctions and, and everything that makes the barrier intact will start to degrade over time and the flow will be drastically reduced. So short answer, I'm speaking a bit, a bit too much. Inflammation of the blood vessels might be one trigger and that's uh, something we can target therapeutically relatively easily by injecting drugs IV, right, intravenously. So that would be a perfect uh, way of targeting uh, the vessels to, to improve vascular function. Hopefully. I think also um, the, the, the fact that you're, you're mentioning the role of inflammation being so, so critical and key in this, in this process um, kind of makes me think about, you know, lifestyle factors, of course, that, you know, aren't necessarily the same as, you know, uh, therapeutically targeting, you know, uh, with the drug, but omega-3 being one of, you know, at the forefront of, um, one, you know, omega-3 transport has been shown um, mechanistically, at least in animal studies, to regulate blood-brain barrier function uh, through the MFSD2A transporter. And um, it's also like many of the metabolites of, of both DHA and EPA, the marine omega-3 fatty acids, are, are involved in resolving inflammation. So they have resolvins, they have the specialized promediating molecules, the SPMs and the maricins. And there's and so um, do you think there could ultimately be, a cl be clinical relevance for omega-3 status in, in regulating dementia-associated, you know, blood-brain barrier leakiness, you know, in humans, or maybe something worth exploring? 
No, I, I, th I cannot agree more. I think there is a uh, more and more studies um, coming up nowadays, Omega-3. And you mentioned MFSD2A, which is uh, one of the markers we are studying carefully because it's specific to the smallest blood vessels in the brain, so the capillaries, and that's where the most of the pericytes are. And there is a recent studies uh, um, that shows that uh, as we age and with dementia, MFSD2A, so the receptor for omega-3, it's reduced at the, at, at the blood vessels. And there is also a link that where there is a reduction of MFSD2A on blood vessels, that's where we see pericyte loss. So we can almost connect what we were we saying earlier. Of course, these are just a few studies and it has to be uh, confirmed. But apparently there's uh, more inflammation of the blood vessels to go back to the first question to link it, which uh, as we age also MFSD 2A transport and other transporters, not only this one, but this one in particular, is decreased at the capillary, at the capillary bed which have an impact apparently on pericyte function because we can see that these hotspots of MFSD, MFSD2A loss are also hotspots of pericyte loss, which means that where we have the leakiness of the barrier. So yes, I cannot agree more. I think we have to study a bit more DHA omega-3 and how this impact blood brain body functions because that could be a, um, some uh, preventive interventions, uh, things like that, even like targetable drugs, like uh, with drugs, but um, yeah, I cannot agree more.